Well, hello there again. This is Rabbi Yaakov Olby coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I hope you are doing fabulous. And are you ready? It's that time. It's the favorite time of the week. It's time for the Parsha podcast. And I've been looking forward to this week's Parsha for a very long time. And the reason why is because the subject that I chose to speak about today is something that I've been looking forward to speaking about for a while. It's uh, one of those wild cards, one of those really interesting and unusual subjects, maybe one of the most interesting laws of the Torah. It's a subject that I find endlessly fascinating, and I'm excited to share some thoughts about it from this week's Parsha on the Parsha podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. The email just says Rabbi Walby at gmail.com. That's two B's, R A B B I W O L B E. So let's begin. It's Parsha's Emmer. And the Parsha begins with the special instructions and restrictions given to the Kohanim. Of course, the Kohanim of the family of Aaron. Aaron is from the tribe of Levi, but he is special and unique because he becomes the Kohen. He gets consecrated as the Kohen, him and his four sons and their subsequent descendants. And they are special. They are holy to God. And there are special laws and restrictions that apply to them due to their extra holiness. They are designated to perform the service in the tabernacle and subsequently in the temple, and they have to be holy, and they cannot be desecrated or defiled or profaned. They're in charge of the operations of the temple. They are the emissaries of the Jewish people. They are almost like intermediaries praying on our behalf, doing the service and the sacrifices on our behalf, and they are special. And the two specific laws that are mentioned as we kickstart our parsha, parshas emor, are the laws with respect to becoming impure, ritually impure, to defiling themselves, namely coming into contact with dead people. And we're told the laws, the ordinary standard Kohen, so that's basically everyone amongst the family of the Kohanim, they cannot become impure, they cannot become in contact with dead people, with the exception of their seven close relatives, father, mother, sister, brother, son, daughter, God forbid if their daughter or son dies, and wife. These are the seven close relatives. For all the dead people in the world, you can't go to their funeral, you can't go and pay your last respects, you can't even visit the cemetery, but for seven people, when these seven close relatives die, you can participate and partake in their funeral. However, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, the one priest who is in charge of the entire family, the uber priest of them all, he cannot defile himself. He cannot come into contact with a dead body, with a cadaver, with a corpse, even if it is one of his close relatives. So that's one of the laws that our parish begins with. And then there is the law of who they can marry. They're special. They're unique. They have extra holiness that us standard issue Israelites, we don't have. And therefore, there are restrictions on who they can marry. So an ordinary coin, they are barred from marrying a harlot or a divorcee or a tarnished daughter of a coin. Meaning if the father is a coin, and the father married the someone that he was not allowed to marry, then the product of that, the child, the progeny of that is prohibited to a second Kohen. So if you're an ordinary Kohen, a standard Kohen, you're not the Kohen Gadol, you're not the high priest, you're just a regular priest, you are allowed to marry a widow. A woman, God forbid, her husband dies. She's a widow. She is eligible to marry a Kohen. A Kohen can indeed marry a widow. But if there is a divorce, a divorcee, or a halala, which is like a tarnished daughter of a coin, or a zona, which is a harlot, and the details of that are explicated in the Talmud, those women are prohibited for a ordinary coin. Whereas a coin gadol, he has extra restrictions. So just like with respect to coming into contact with dead people, the Kohen Gadol has extra restrictions with respect to who he can marry. The Kohen Gadol has extra restrictions. He cannot even marry 
a widow, he has to marry a virgin who was never with another man. So these are the special laws of the Kohanim. And even today, of course, we don't have a temple, and we don't have a Sanhedrin, and we don't have a Jewish king, and we don't have Jewish law as the law of the land. So we don't have a high priest. But nevertheless, if you are a Kohen, you're not allowed to marry a divorcee or a harlot or a woman who is like the tarnished daughter of a Kohen. And again, the other law, you cannot come into contact with the dead. You don't go to the funerals. You don't go to cemetery unless it's one of the seven close relatives delineated in our Parsha. If you actually go to a Jewish cemetery, you'll notice that all the names – on the edge of the cemetery are names like Cohen or Cone or Katz, kind of standard names of the Kohanic family. Why? Because the Cohen cannot walk into the cemetery, but could come to the edge of the cemetery, you know, to pay respects, to visit the resting spots of their deceased relatives without violating this law. Of course, when we restore the office of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, with the third temple, then the Kohen Gadol will not be able to attend the funerals of even close relatives. He cannot lose his holiness. He cannot depart from the temple, even for a close relative. These are the laws that kickstart our Parsha. But there's one small exception. There's one very rare, very unique scenario where a Kohen, and even the grand Kohen, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, they not only are allowed to, they must defile their holiness and come into contact with a dead body with a cadaver. This is actually featured in Rashi to verse number 11. The verse says, Val kol nefashos meis lo yavo. This is talking about the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. He cannot come into contact with a dead body. Any dead body. La aviv ulimo lo yitama. To his father and his mother, he cannot become impure. So Rashi's question is, why is there a need to add the final part of the verse? The verse already says he cannot come into contact with any dead body. Why does it need to add to his father and his mother he cannot come into contact? So Rashi tells us that this is teaching that there is one unique case where the Kohen Gadol can indeed defile himself, and become impure by handling a dead body. And therefore it's saying to his father, his mother, to them specifically, he cannot become impure. But to this other scenario, he can. And what's this other scenario? What's this one case where Kohen Gadol is allowed to become impure? That is a mace mitzvah. A dead, the word mace, or mavet, death. A dead body of a mitzvah. This is the law that we're going to talk about today, a mace mitzvah. What does this mean? It means that there's a dead body and there's no one to bury that dead body. There's an unattended corpse. There is a cadaver with no one to take care of it. That's called a mace mitzvah in the words of Rashi in the Talmud. And this is the one exception the Kohen Gadol cannot go to his brother's funeral, his father's funeral, his mother's funeral, cannot come into the same room or the same enclosure as a dead body. But if he finds a mace mitzvah, if he finds a body that doesn't, we don't even know who it is, it's an unidentified, unattended corpse lying on the ground, he must bury that body, even if that means that he touches it, handles it, of course, buries it and becomes pure via the Laws of purity and impurity, you handle a dead body, you touch a dead body, you become impure. This is the halacha. Of course, it's featured in the law. A kohen, even a kohen gadol, who encounters a mace mitzvah, an unattended corpse, behold, they become impure to it. Even the high priest, you have to bury it. And what is the example of an unattended corpse, a mace mitzvah. So the Rambam tells us, Echad Nisrael, it's a Jew who was just cast about along the way. There's no one to bury them. That would be an instance where you would be allowed, or the Kohen would be, in fact, obligated to bury this unattended corpse. Says the Rambam, when does this apply? 
when the coin's by himself. So if the coin's traveling with his retinue, with his entourage, and there's a bunch of Israelites there, of course, they would handle it. But suppose the coin is alone, or the coin Godola high priest is alone. They're by themselves. There's no one with them. And they call out, and they holler, and they scream about, is anyone around here to help me? And no one responds. In that instance, it's just them. And they have no one else to pass this task off to. And they must defile themselves, become impure, and bury the person, the man, the cadaver that is unattended. Really interesting law here. So again, Rashi mentions it briefly in verse 11. All these restrictions, you can become impure, but, you know, dad's funeral you can't go to, mom's funeral, no. But if you see a corpse just lying about and there's no one else to bury this person, it's a mace mitzvah. And the Kohen Gadol becomes impure. Really interesting idea. And the Talmud explains, it's just a terrible disgrace for a person to just lie there, unattended, unburied, and it's imperative to bury them as soon as possible, even if that would render the person who's burying them, the Kohen, impure, and it would be totally inappropriate under ordinary circumstances. And even the Kohen Gadol, if they encounter the body and they're alone and there's no one with them and they holler out and no one's there, it's just them, he must defile himself and bury the corpse. Now, the Talmud has a bunch of interesting dilemmas about this concept, this law of the unattended corpse. So, for example, we know the biggest mitzvah of them all, the most important mitzvah of them all is Torah study. So, you're in the middle of Torah study. Do you stop the Torah study to bury the unattended corpse? The answer is yes. Temple service. You're the going adult. You're the high priest. You're a regular priest. Today's your day to do the work in the temple. Once you become impure, you have to go through the whole process of restoring the purity with the red heifer, the whole deal. You would not be able to do the service in the temple. Nevertheless, you defile yourself. The Talmud says, well, what about if you have the unattended dead body and you could read the book of Esther and Purim, it's only one over the other, you have to tend to the unattended body. What about the Paschal sacrifice, one of the most important mitzvahs that we do the whole year? It's Erev Pesach. We're about to go to the temple and offer the sacrifice. Talmud says, or you're going to do the circumcision of your son. Very important mitzvahs, iconic mitzvahs of the Jewish life and the Jewish year. Nevertheless, tending to the unattended dead overrides the pastoral sacrifice and the circumcision of one's son. It's very critically important to busy oneself with burying the unattended corpse. That's the law in our Parsha. Now, just to round out our understanding of this mitzvah, where do you bury the body? So suppose you're traveling... It's a couple of thousand years thousand years ago. You're a Kohen, let's say. You're, you're traveling to the northern part of, the, part of Israel, just you by yourself. And you're driving along the way and you see this corpse on, on the road. Where do you bury the corpse? So the Talmud tells us that it, it depends. If you find it outside of a city, then you just bury it in its place. If you find it in a city, you bring it to the cemetery. What if you find it on someone else's property? So if you find it on a field, it could be a, a field that's a really important field where they plant really, really expensive stuff. Nevertheless, you bury the body exactly where you found it, even if it means that that field will no longer be able to yield that very important and expensive produce. In fact, the Talmud tells us, really interesting, that when Joshua conquered the land... And he dispensed it. He delivered it to the Jewish people. It was done on condition. And the condition is, I'm giving you this land, but I'm reserving the rights, so to speak. I'm reserve, I'm maintaining and preserving the rights that your land is really yours. But in the event that there's an unattended corpse that ends up on your field, it is reverted back to my ownership, to the ownership of the Jewish people. And that person becomes the owner of that land and they can be buried in your field. Talmud says if you find the unattended corpse 
on a road. So you don't want to bury, of course, the corpse on the road. You go either to the right or to the left. But in the field, it acquires its own domain. It, that person, that entity, whatever you call the corpse, the corpse, the cadaver becomes the owner of that location. You dig a grave and you bury them there. There is an incredible story in the Talmud. Thomas talking about Rabbi Akiva. Of course, Rabbi Akiva, we know him as the greatest sage of his era, the vital link that perpetuated the oral Torah to the next generation, the great hero who started his studies as a 40-year-old ignoramus, not even knowing how to read Hebrew, and became the greatest sage of his time. So the Talmud tells us a story, fascinating story. Rabbi Kiva, after he had started studying, but before he became an apprentice of the great sages, so he had begun his tenure to study and to amass knowledge, but he hadn't yet studied under the tutelage and the guidance and the auspices of the great sages. He hadn't, com- he hadn't yet quite committed himself to study under their guidance. So the following story happened. He was traveling along the way, and he encountered an unattended corpse. And he lifted this body, trying to fulfill the mitzvah. He lifted the body, and he carried it. He lugged the corpse for four mil, so like, I don't know, five miles or so, until he found a cemetery where he buried said corpse. And then he rushed over to the academy to speak to the sages, the great Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yoshua, and he told them what happened, and they responded, every single step that you took is a step that really is the equivalent of the crime almost of murder. Why? Because the law states that the dead, the unattended dead, acquires the place that they are found in. And therefore, you shouldn't have carried the dead body, and it's not pleasant for the dead body to be carried and transported, and that's like really painful for the dead body, for the dead person, whatever that means, and therefore it's like a real crime, and because of your lack of scholarship and your lack of apprenticeship under the tutelage of the great sages, that's why you made such a big blunder. And Rabbi Kiva added to the story, he says, I tried to do a mitzvah, I wanted to do what's right, there's the unattended corpse, that's the halacha. And I, I dragged that carry on my back for four mil, like, you know, four or five miles. And think about it. If you tried to do a mitzvah and you blundered so terribly, all the more so, if someone is not trying to do a mitzvah, how many blunders will they make? And therefore, says Rabbi Kiva, he concludes the story in the Talmud. From that moment on, I never departed the tutelage and the apprenticeship under the sages. And he used to have a line that he would say, an aphorism, an axiom that he would tell. And that is, he who does not apprentice under the sages, katolachayev, is liable to get killed. Very harsh statement. How important it is to know not just the, you know, the general contours of a given law, because if you study, you'll know the general contours of a given law, but you have to actually study under the apprenticeship of a real master to know the actual details, namely, in this example, the detail that the unattended corpse is buried where it is found because it acquires the land. A really interesting, really interesting story. Really shocking story, of course. You know, I think if we're not real experts in Torah quite yet, this is maybe a comforting story. Because this is Rabbi Akiva. And if there's a law that we don't know, it's comforting to know that at least at one point in his tenure, in his career, the great Rabbi Akiva, before his ascent, he too did not know all the laws. And uh, maybe we're in good company. But still, I think this does show us the expectation of what really Torah is supposed to do to us. We have to know exactly what Hashem wants from us. And we're trying to continually upgrade ourselves until we know exactly what the money wants of us in every situation. 
And Rabbi Kiva was told here, you thought you knew what the Imani wanted, but you got it so wrong that it's, on a, on a certain level, it's tantamount to murder what you did. Very interesting story. So that's the idea. That's the law. The law of the mace mitzvah, the law of the unattended corpse. So what I was thinking to do, I just I happen to find it just such a fascinating idea. And I have some thoughts that I want to share with you. But first, I want to, I want to share three ideas slash stories that I heard on this subject from my grandfather. And I'll share that, and then I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on this issue. So the first thing, my grandfather used to tell the following story of the great Rabbi Israel Salanter. He was, of course, the founder of the Musser movement, but he was really, you know, the, the Torah giant of the 19th century. And he was someone who tried to make everything that he studied to make it real, to, to make it practical. And, you know, there's a big gulf between what we know and even what we know to be true and what we actually do and how we live. And the true measure of a person is how they behave, how they interact with people, how they comport themselves, the actual choices that they make in utilizing, implementing, so to speak, their body. If you have very lofty ideas in your head, but the way you behave is not quite living up to that standard, well then, the way you behave really dominates who you are. A true Torah style has to mimic the ark, gold inside, gold outside, the way you are internally and the way you actually present yourself. They have to match. They both have to be golden. That's maybe the, the overarching principle of, of the Musser movement that Rabbi Israel Salanter founded. And that is this idea of taking the Torah and bringing it to the last mile that it, it actually impacts who you are and how you behave. It changes you fundamentally as a person. It doesn't just be this idea. It's not just a discipline like any other, God forbid. This is the Almighty's guidance for how we're supposed to act and behave and what we are supposed to become. So here's the story. He was once middle of prayer. And he was saying, the Shema. So this is, you know, the climax of the prayer. One of the, well, getting close to the climax of the prayer, but, you know, one of the high points of the prayer. And he heard in the shul, there were two members of the Hevra Kadisha, of the burial society. They were lazy, and they were tired, and they were cranky. And there was a body that needed to be buried. And one guy said, you know what? Well, why don't you do it? Ah, I'm too tired. Oh, no, I, I did it last time. You should do it now. So the great rabbi heard this, and he quickly took off his tefillin, middle of prayer, middle of the Shema. And he ran to go bury the dead. Why? Because this is a mace mitzvah. This is an unattended corpse. There's a corpse of a person who needs tending, and no one wants to do it. I'll do it. And I think this is a nice idea in general. The importance of making Torah not just not just academic, not just abstract, but always translating it into action. Always focusing, you know, what what's the lesson? What's the takeaway? What's the change that I can implement into how I behave? Like, how am I going to conduct myself differently based upon the Torah? The Torah is guidance from God. It's not just an idea to think about, to cogitate upon. It's the guidelines, the guidebook, the instruction manual for how to behave, how to live. And therefore, it's important to, to live up to it, not just to know the laws of the unattended corpse, but to always have that at your forefront, and that in every law at, at the forefront, when can I implement it? How can I behave, act upon what I know? My grandfather, blessed memory, he codified the idea of an unattended live person. So the law that we found here in Rashi, this law that we're talking about, is about the unattended dead. A mace mitzvah, they're dead, and it's a mitzvah to tend to them. My grandfather codified this idea of an unattended living person. And the way I heard it 
for the first time, when I was 16, I was shipped to Israel to go study in the yeshiva in Israel. Now, a lot of uh, American kids go to yeshiva in Israel. It's a very common, a common thing. But I went to an all-Israeli yeshiva. So this is just full of Israelis. There were a few Anglos, people who had some Anglo backgrounds. But I was like the only American kid in the entire institution. And this, this, this is not just a run of the mill yeshiva. This was considered to be an elite, still is an elite institution, one of the absolute best in the country. My grandfather of blessed memory, he was of the opinion that this yeshiva was not just one of the best yeshivas in the country and the world. He thought it was the absolute best yeshiva in the world, very selective in their admissions. I think they had one of the lowest acceptance rates based upon applications. And uh, and I uh, joined the yeshiva at the age of 16. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was a rough, rough year, shall we say. But uh, I had this memory just yesterday when I'm thinking about this, this law of what happened at the very beginning of, uh, of my stay there in the yeshiva. So this was like an institution where it was almost like a gated uh, complex and a few buildings. One of the buildings is the base madrish where like the study hall. And then there's an adjacent building that was the dormitories. But this is, this is the yeshiva. You know, this is not, uh, you know, the fancy, uh, finishing stools or anything like that. So the dormitories, it was not exactly the Ritz Carlton, can we say? This is, this is not a five star hotel here. So in my room, the, right when I got there, the room, the, the, the dormitory room that I was assigned to, there were, there were six boys in one room. And there was one guy there who no one really liked. He was, he actually was, um, also a foreigner. He was from a South American country. But he was, shall we say, he was a legacy admission. He'd gotten based upon his family connections, even though, to be perfectly honest, I too was a legacy admission. But he had one of those qualities that you really don't want in a roommate. He wasn't a particularly hygienic, if you know what I mean. I don't know if it was a cultural thing or not. But he, I maybe mean, I shouldn't even tell a story, but whatever. I'm protecting the identity of the uh, involved there. But he didn't really like to shower, and when he did, he didn't. He didn't love the idea of soap. But anyhow, we were 16 years old. Like we're not developed enough to really deal with this. And uh, and I remember going over to one of the heads of the yeshiva and complaining. You know, we have this guy and. Mm, not the best roommate, and it's very unpleasant, and what do we do? And I remember him telling me, in the name of my grandfather, he said, your grandfather invented this concept, that there is a mace mitzvah, there's a dead person, and it's a mitzvah to tend to them. But there's also a living mitzvah, a chai mitzvah. If there's a dead person without anyone to tend to them, and you have to tend to them, all the more so if there is a living person and then no one wants to deal with them and they're a drag on society and they cause a lot of pain and there's no expectation of any good things happening your way, just like a dead person. A dead person, you bear the dead, nothing good is going to happen towards you. You're not going to benefit in, in any tangible way from this. You got to tend to the dead. When there's someone like this, who really has very few redeeming qualities, at least, you know, of course, everyone's created the image of God and, you know, and he was a kid and, but it's hard to speak. You're speaking to teenagers, young teenagers there. That was the idea that he told me. And I just, it kind of popped into my head as I'm researching this uh, yesterday. I said, you know what, I'll tell over the story uh, about, about this idea. Because he quoted it in the name of my grandfather about the living unattended and the importance, if it's so important to tend to someone who no one's to deal with, who no one's involved, only you can help them, only you can tend to them. They need help, you got to do it, 
certainly if they're alive as well, which is a very interesting idea. Now, <laughs> yesterday as well, when I was researching this subject, I found something else in my grandfather's letters. And he said the same concept. He phrased it or he framed it a little bit differently. He says we have this mitzvah, this very important mitzvah of burying the mace mitzvah of burying the unattended corpse. And this overrides the restriction against becoming impure of the Kohen, even of the Kohen Gadol, even if that means that he cannot do the work on Yom Kippur. Why? Because if you have a dead body, and man is created in the image of God, and the body is just cast about, lined in disgrace, and there's no one to bury that body, there's no one to tend to them, that's the law of the unattended corpse. But there's also the idea of a living unattended person. And that's someone that there's no one to tend to. They're on their own. They have no oversight. They have no guidance. They have no one giving them direction in life. They are unattended. And he quotes in his letter, our sages equate a Torah teacher to a parent, meaning that just like a parent has to give guidance and instruction and direction and to be there as a support infrastructure for the child, for the child to grow up healthy. Similarly, that's the role of a teacher. I think my grandfather's writing this letter to a fellow educator to, to show him the importance of what he needs to do. And when someone does not have that role, there's no guide, there's no one directing them, there's no one tending to them, they're going to grow up askew. They're going to be unprincipled, undisciplined, underdeveloped. And you could fill their head with a lot of knowledge. They can memorize a lot of facts. They could study even a lot of Torah. They could be seemingly alive, seemingly spiritually vibrant. But they need guidance. And they're like an unattended living person. And as an aside, this is one of my grandfather's crusades over his life, the importance of, of pedagogy, of, of training, of guiding students and children. In fact, my grandfather's magnum opus, Alei Shur, if you look at the actual book, it has two titles. It's called Alei Shur, but it's also called Sha'arei Hadracha, which means the gates of guidance. People need to be trained. They need to be guided. They need to be directed. And if not, they're like the living unattended, which is just this, this helpless waste of human potential. It's, it's like the, the image of God lying in disgrace. They're alive, but they're not living up to the great dreams and the great potential and possibilities of what it means to be a human. That's courtesy of my grandfather. I want to suggest perhaps a, a new way to look at this very unusual law. It's an amazing thing. And our Parsha starts off, the Kohen, you can't, you're a Kohen, you can't become impure. You have to maintain your purity, preserve the purity. You, but there's a funeral, you don't go. There's a dead body, you don't deal with it. Why? Of course, the laws of purity are very complicated, very hard for us to understand. What does it even mean? A separate discussion we've talked about in the past at length. But you're a Kohen. And a Kohen does not become impure. The Kohen Gadol, your mother dies. Terrible. The person who birthed you, the person who raised you, you don't go to the funeral. You are so holy, you're designated for God and for the people. You're separate from society. You're different. You're not part of the ordinary folk. You are the property almost of the Jewish people and God. That's it. Your individual identity, so to speak, is secondary to the role that you play amongst our nation. And it's almost Yom Kippur. And of course, Yom Kippur is the climax of the Jewish year. And that's when the Kohen Gadol has his most outsized role. For seven days before Yom Kippur, he's preparing, separated from his family, separated from society. And what happens 
if he encounters an unattended corpse on the day before Yom Kippur. He's walking by himself, just accept this scenario. He's walking by himself and he, he sees, looks like a homeless guy, no ID. Is he, is he Jewish or not? We don't even know. But if the majority of the population of that town is Jewish, we have to assume he is and he requires a Jewish burial. And remember, what happens if the Kohen Gadol touches the dead body? He's impure. And there's a whole long process for him to restore his purity. And that's going to torpedo the entire Yom Kippur service that the whole nation relies upon. But the conditions are such that the Kohen Gadol is alone. There's no one with him. And he calls out, Is there anyone around to help me? Help bury this dead body? And there's no one there. And the law is that he must defile himself and bury it. Notwithstanding all the chaos and the upheaval and the disruption that that will unleash upon the entire people. Of course, it's important to remember, there is a backup Kohen. There is the Kohen, the relief pitcher coming out of the bullpen. But still, this is the Kohen God doll. It's once a year, it's Yom Kippur. You become impure. For the unattended corpse, how do we make sense of this? So I want to suggest an idea that maybe reveals some of the secret behind the Mace Mitzvah, behind the unattended corpse. I think this is an idea that even though this is obviously not very relevant to us, thankfully, and I imagine that the majority of the audience listening is not a Kohen, Israelites like me, standard issue Israelites. So the whole idea of refraining from becoming impure is not, it's not a law for us. But nevertheless, I think the idea that I'm going to suggest, I think it can be broadly applicable even to us. What are the circumstances of the unattended corpse? So remember we quoted earlier, there are certain conditions. Only under these conditions can the Kohen become impure. He has to be alone. There's no one else to do it. There's no one else with him. And he has to holler. Call, is there anyone else here who can help me? And he calls out and there's, there's no one else. You're hollering on top of your lungs, but you're alone and it's just you. And this need, this mitzvah, to bury this poor chap to bury him, can only be fulfilled by you. So here's the theory, and we'll elaborate more about it. Whenever there is something that needs to get done, and it can only be done by you, that is something that you must do, and you must do right away, and you are not allowed to shirk responsibilities, it must ascend to the absolute top of your priority list. Let's explain. I think that, you know, the most important question that we all have to ask ourselves in life is what should I do? What should I focus my limited time and abilities and resources in the sojourn that I have in this world? What am I spending my time and resources on? What choices should I make with my life? What does my creator expect of me? And of course, we have an answer to this question. The answer to these questions are Torah. We have Torah. It's the complete manual for living. What to do with life? Well, the Almighty communicated to us what he wants us to do. He told us how to live life in the most appropriate and the most rewarding and the most eternally beneficial manner. He gave us the guidebook and delivered it to us via his prophets. We have the answers. We know what to do in life. What an amazing gift. And all the opacity and murkiness and uncertainty and confusion and aimlessness. We have a way. We have a path. We have guidance. We are told what we need to do in this world by the original manufacturer. And we've been following this guidance of course, with varying degrees of commitment, but we've been following the Torah for more than 
30 centuries. And you know what? It still works. Our society is flourishing. Our communities are strong. Our lives are bursting with meaning and purpose and pleasure. Things are working out. We're lucky. We are so fortunate to have a divinely ordained way to live. While the other societies, other peoples, are flying blind, we have a compass. We have a roadmap. We have direction. I think it's something that we're likely to take for granted. But I think every once in a while it's worthy to ruminate upon what this means. We know the answers to the questions of life. God chose us from all the other nations, but because of Abraham, of course, and he gave us his Torah. And how lucky are we? How fortunate are we? How much joy this ought to bestow upon us to know that we have a way to live. But then there's the individual question. This is an idea we talk about a lot. We are all unique. And if you haven't taken away this idea, you got to listen to more Parsha podcasts. We're all unique. And we all have a unique purpose. So what are you here to do? What's your life's mission? What's life all about? So the general answer to that question is, well, that's that's what the Torah is about. The Torah is going to tell you what you're supposed to do with life. But the 630 mitzvahs of the Torah, that is universally applied to our people. Every person, in addition to the general responsibilities that we all have, Every individual also has a unique role to play, a unique responsibility that they must fulfill. There's something that makes me different, me and you and everyone. We're all different and unique, and there's no there's no two peas in a pod. Every individual is completely unique. There is a unique attribute to every soul. And every soul is, the individual soul is completely unique. It's one of a kind, and there's no others like it. As a result, every person has a unique role to play. There's something that expects of you that no one else can do, and no one else is required to do. There's some sort of personal, individual mission that everyone is uniquely positioned and expected to do. So if you were to ask the question, what are we here for? What are we trying to do? What's the mission? How do we live a good life? Our answer is, well, you got to follow the Torah. And what does that mean? That means you got to follow the rules of the Torah, the guidance, the dicta of the Torah. Follow that. But also you got to figure out what your calling is, what your mission is, what makes you unique, and what is the aspect of you to the exclusion of everyone else? What is something that you need to contribute that no one else can. In addition to the general mission, you have a specific mission. There's a personal mission that you have. But identifying that, that's a little trickier. That's a little harder. How do we find out what our personal mission is? So, of course, our our sages, they guide us. Every person has unique things that they connect to. Some people like studying these things, and some people like studying that things. And some people find this area of life where they feel a unique connection to. The Talmud says you can't study Torah unless it's the right kind of place for you and like kind of the right kind of subject matter that really connects with you. There's a topic that your heart desires. That's really where you need to make your impact. Everyone has their own spiritual fingerprint, which again includes the qualities the positive qualities, the actual soul that you have, which is unique. Of course, it also, you know, your spiritual identity is also the flaws and the shortcomings, but also the mission. Everyone's different. Everyone's differentiated spiritually and completely unique. And that mission, that mission, that's your spiritual name. And when you die and you are investigated and interrogated by the heavenly tribunal, the judgment exists, our tell us, on two fronts. 
How did you execute your general responsibility of following the Torah that is universally applicable? But also, how did you do on your own unique individual personal responsibility? But again, as we mentioned, discovering that mission, finding out why why specifically you were placed here, that is our life's goal. That's maddeningly difficult. And to figure it out, you have to be very alert, very attentive to exactly what the Almighty gave you, what tools did He give you, what temperaments did He give you, what inclinations did He give you, what talents and abilities and skills did He give you, and what situation did He place you in, and what circumstances did He position you in. And, of course, unless you have a prophet, you don't really know for sure, right? We've mentioned this in the past. The Gona Vilna says that that's the role that prophets used to play. The job of the prophet was to reveal to every individual what exactly their unique calling is. You go to the prophet and you say, this this specifically is what you need to do. Of course, everyone knows what the Torah is. Not everyone knows, but... The rules of the Torah are revealed, and that is part of the obligation of every individual, but your specific role, that was told to you by the prophet. What if you don't have a prophet? What do you do? So, the way I think this actually happens is that you make make certain assumptions. You, You take an educated guess, and you make a move. I'm assuming this is what I need to do. And then you maybe adapt. You pivot. And you revisit it. And you and you hone and redefine your personal mission through this process of trial and error. Of course, if, if you're serious about this, let's suppose you're really serious. Suppose there's a person who says, I really want to do exactly what the money wants me to do. Well, then you, you can't be too committed because unless you have a prophet, how do you know for sure that that's your personal mission? So you have to be willing to pivot and to improvise and to change things along the way if you get more direction. So let's get to the most important and prestigious person in the nation. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Someone who has reached the absolute pinnacle of the Jewish world. This is the person who walks into the Holy of Holies once a year. The highlight of the year for everyone, certainly for him, he's been preparing for it the whole year. Imagine you're the Kohen Gadol, high priest. The eyes of the whole people are upon you. They're all counting on you going in there and praying on their behalf and confessing for them and having their sins cleansed. And really, we know that the, the future of the whole nation hinges upon your prayers. And seven days before Yom Kippur, you're taken away from your house and you spend seven days of intense preparation to get in the zone to prepare for this holiest day. And what do you know? Somehow, you find yourself bumping into this homeless guy. You took a walk out of the temple. You got rid of your your shadows. And you just you just happen to encounter this, this dead homeless guy, and you're you're alone. It's just you, and this person needs to be buried as soon as possible, pronto. And you're hollering for help, but it's just you. What you what do you do? You bury the body. I think we can suggest that this is a little window into what God wants of the Kohen Gadol as an individual. He had been under the assumption. He had assumed that God wants him to serve as the high priest. That's what he assumed. But no, he was just informed that God wants something else from him entirely. This is something that only you can do. This is what you need to do. Who will do the service? Someone else will do it. Whenever there's something that is impossible for someone else to do, 
it cannot be done by another person, that is a sign that this is your individual mission. This is what God wants you to do. This is what you need to do. And these individualized mitzvahs, when God sends something to you that only you can do it, that always has to float all the way to the top. Because this is what God's telling you. I want you to do this and I want you to do it right now. Perhaps that's the theory of the unattended dead. It's a message from God. Sometimes God sends us a message to the individual. It's almost like a prophecy of sorts. I'm talking to you as an individual. This is what your spiritual fingerprint needs. This is something that only you can do. And therefore, it's something that you must do it. And it overrides everything else that you had planned. All those plans must be discarded. Because now God's telling you, this is what you need to do. Perhaps we can even say, this is why, you know, the unattended corpse acquires the place. You know, we are flying blind. And the question of what we need to do generally, we have a sister team. We have the Torah. We have the interpretation of the Torah. We have the oral Torah. We have the halacha. We know what we need to do with respect to the general responsibility. With respect to the individual responsibility, us, our own unique mission, that is a little bit more tricky. And I would even argue that that applies not just to, you know, a person, time and place, but also to other resources. You have a piece of land. What does the Almighty expect you to do with this land? So you have to make an assumption. Unless you have a prophet, you have to make an assumption. We don't know. How are you supposed to know? You don't know unless you have a prophecy. But every once in a while, just like the Almighty reveals in this really strange case, he reveals to the coin what he needs to do. He also reveals about that given place. Why was this place created? We don't know. We can make assumptions until we get a clear directive from God. So I think this is a very powerful idea that can be extended to other areas of life. We have something that we need to do, and it's our life's mission to identify that, or it's a life pursuit to identify that mission. And every once in a while, we will encounter something that needs to get done, and we are just positioned to do it. It's just us. And you try to get some help, and no, no, it's just you. And it seems to go against your plans. You, you had made plans. And these plans, they just it wasn't, wasn't in the cards. You had assumed that something else would be happening. And then you get the curveball. What do I do now? Perhaps we can suggest that that is a clear directive from God. Something that is going to override and trump those assumed Assumed behaviors. I was thinking last week we spoke about in the exquisite insight. I know most of y'all already, already tuned out by the time the exquisite insight came about last week. And most of y'all probably tuned out already this week. But for those that listened, the exquisite insight last week was about Nadav and Avihu, two sons of Aaron, and how they died twice. They refused to settle. They didn't want to marry down. And thus, they died childless. And we implied from that as well, if you do leave a child, you do have eternal life. So I was thinking, maybe, maybe this is the idea. When someone is blessed with a child, well, that's responsibility placed upon their shoulders by God. Only you can be this child's dad or mom. There's something here. This is like an example almost. Of the, of the theme, of the idea, the theory of the unattended corpse. There's something that only you can do. And therefore, if you do it, you do it properly, you execute your responsibilities, then indeed you will never die because, by definition, the success in such a mission will reverberate for all eternity. So how do we find our purpose? How do we find our individual mission? How do we identify our calling? How do we find the specific thing for which we were placed here? Perhaps they can be identified by the 
proverbial unattended corpses. That he's that he pronounced it corpsi corpsels corpses is corpses of life. Those things that just that just fall into your lap and and you could do it, but no one else can. That's a sign that this. And specifically to the exclusion of your previous plans, well-laid, well-crafted plans, this is what God wants of you. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. Are you ready? Back to the Kohen, laws of the Kohen. So we talked about the law against becoming impure. What about the laws of who they can marry? So we were told the regular, ordinary, standard Kohen he can marry a widow, not a divorcee, not a harlot, not a tarnished daughter of a Kohen, but a widow he can marry. But a Kohen Gadol cannot even marry a widow, has to marry someone who was never married previously. Now, the obvious question is, wait a minute. What is wrong with a woman whose husband died? How was she damaged the goods in any way? It's not her fault that her husband died. Why would she be disqualified from marrying a Kohen Gadol? As we see, she can marry an ordinary Kohen. Why can she not marry a Kohen Gadol? That's an interesting question. And if you look at the Sefer HaChinuch, which is the book that organizes the mitzvahs in the order in which they appear in the Torah, so mitzvah number 272 is the prohibition against a Kohen Gadol, a high priest, marrying a widow. And the exclusive rights that he has to marry are only, it's only exclusively, he can only marry a virgin unmarried. So he's a very intriguing piece on this idea as to why a Kohen Gadol can only marry a virgin who was never married before. But I saw something really, really interesting maybe even a tad disturbing, but I think it's it's fascinating. In a book called Moshav Zakenim, authored by the great medieval commentators on the Talmud, the Bali Atosvos, the, the authors of the Tosvos, they say something like this. Listen to this. The Kohen Gadol had special superpowers. There's only one of them, remember, only one of them. They walk into the Holy of Holies. And they were the ones, the only ones, who could enunciate the ineffable name of God. And you remember that they had the Urim and the Tumim, that special, almost proxy for prophecy, that slipped in behind the breastplate that would illuminate the letters on the Chosh on the breastplate. They had special powers. And what they prayed for on Yom Kippur they would get. And the Torah was worried. What's going to be if there's a Kohen who takes a liking for a married woman? He has a way to secure that woman. How so? On Yom Kippur, when he's saying his special prayers, and all of his prayers that he prays for on that day are going to be answered, he'll just pray let that man die, and I'll scoop up his wife. And in order to prevent this terrible corruption of the office of the Kohen Gadol, in order to remove that possibility in its entirety, that's the reason, or that's one of the reasons that we can suggest, tell us the Baliatosos, that's one of the reasons that we can suggest as to why the Kohen is not allowed to marry a widow, because we're worried there's a concern, maybe something just terrible, awful will happen. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, will want to marry a married woman. And he can find a solution to the problem that does not involve manslaughter or first-degree murder. Just sneak in a prayer and you get it answered. And therefore, that possibility is removed. He can only marry a woman who was never married. Very interesting, very fascinating. So first of all, I think it's just... Noteworthy that the Kohen Gadol had all these powers. You know, on Shabbos, in the weeks between Pesach and Shavuos, there is an ancient and ubiquitous tradition to study Pirkei Avos in Shul in Shabbos afternoon. So this past week, we were up to the Mishnah 
about the imperative to be a disciple of Aaron. Oh, hey, shalom, loving of peace, pursuing peace, loving humanity, and bringing them close to Torah. So the Rabbeinu Yonah there says, just how would how would Aaron bring people close to Torah via befriending them? Oh, it was Abrius, loving humanity, and thereby bringing them close to Torah. So he says that Aaron knew whenever there was someone amongst the nation who needed a pick-me-up, who needed to have a spiritual boost, who needed to be brought back close to Torah. So to me, like this is almost a similar idea. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, bearing the Urim and the Tumim, is like tantamount to a prophet, had immense power, and there's a concern that maybe he's going to pray that the husband of the married woman he covets will die, and then that man is just done for, and to prevent that, he cannot marry a widow. Now, in the spirit of Rabbi Israel Salanter, we always are looking for a lesson. What is the lesson behind this striking idea? So, so in the book Otsros HaTorah, he suggests that uh, there is a fascinating idea here. You know, the Kohen Gadol were thinking of him as just a holy person, righteous, pious. How do you get that did? You have to be the, the greatest of the Kohanim, the Kohanim, the family, the Kohanim. Of the, these are the sons of Aaron. This, this is not just ordinary people. Of course, no one's ordinary. Certainly no Jews are ordinary. But this is the creme de la creme. This is the best from Aaron. Special people. And the best of them were worried that he's going to descend to such, stoop to such lows to pray that a man dies, an innocent man dies because he wants his wife. Here's the lesson. This is showing us just the potential that we all have within us for doing really, really bad things. And it's important for us to remember that. And he quotes the famous uh, teaching of the Talmud about one of the high priests who was the longest serving high priest of them all. He was a high priest for 80 years. And at the end of his life, he became a heretic. And that reminds us we should never be too confident and cocky. Never be too secure in our spiritual standing. Don't believe in yourself until the day that you die because you never know. You never know. If you are still in the game, if you are still in the arena, if you still have free will, don't be too secure. Even someone who has reached the absolute pinnacle must maintain their vigilance, must maintain their, their, their dogged focus on preserving their righteousness. Even if you're playing a doll, you have to know in the back of your head that the potential of doing something egregious, that is still within your orbit. Because you know why? If you're alive, if you're in the game, invariably, it still is. I thank you for listening. I really enjoyed this Parsha. I've been excited to talk about this topic for a while. Actually, I opened up my notes. I'm like, oh, this is the week about the unattended dead person. I'm so excited to talk about it. I, I think it's an interesting, it's one of those interesting laws that really you don't hear a lot about. I don't know if I've ever discussed it in the past at length on any of the podcasts, but it's interesting. What an interesting thing. I think there's a nice lesson there as well as we try to do. I thank you for listening. Have a great day and a fantastic, splendid, Rest of your week, and of course, a wonderful, peaceful, meaningful, uplifting Shabbos upcoming, Parshas Emor. And please God, please God, please God, please God, we will talk again next week from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, the Parsha Podcast. The email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.